Um, well, well, thank you, Jan, for the nice introduction. Thank you for letting me be here. Um, it's really great. Um, and I'm, I will, I have to admit, I will do a little bit experiment in my first couple of slides. So I actually want to see how much you listened and how much you learned. So obviously, these are my opinions um, and uh, not Nestle's opinions. But if you want to fund me, then you can do this. Um, <laughs> I um, perhaps with some crowdfunding that would be great, um, but obviously I have some conflicts of interest as we all do. Well, um, I often start with beauty, and 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 some of you might have listened to my talks before. And the reason why I start with beauty is uh, beauty, beauty had epilepsy, um, and she taught me a lot. Um, and she taught me a lot about how traumatic this disease is, and she has also taught me a lot because um, she was at the end 17 years of age. Uh, very wise is also the way we can talk about canine cognitive dysfunction um, because obviously even this, the video is not stopping, but um, you see in a second where she's just sniffing um, on, a, on, a, on a grass, on a little flower, um, being, being not really present, and then suddenly she perks up again, right? Um, she was at the end 17 years of age. You can hold them a long time, and it was really difficult to know when the end was the right time. So what we do talk today, we talk about epilepsy, and we also talk about cognition, we also talk about behavior, and I'll tell you later why that is. So, now what I would like you to do first is that we um, do a little bit Mentimeter. Um, I would like to ask you what do you think about the relationship between epilepsy, the gut, and the aging brain. This is now the moment you take your smartphone and you take a picture, then it comes to your Internet Explorer, and then you type in a very intelligent answer. <laughs> and we will be later know who did the answers, because I have tracking now. <laughs> yeah. Did some, anyone write something yet? It's not working. I'm just waiting for answers. So, let me go back. It should have gone. Ah, fantastic. Whatever great means. Okay. Fantastic. I can say it one more time, fantastic, and then you ask me to leave the podium. Good. That's very interesting. So we'll, we'll look at this later again. So a lot of people complex connections, and now people get a bit erratic and have a seizure. That's good. Um, so, so I did, did in preparation of these talks because obviously there are some lead innovations nowadays. And one of them, I'm sure you know this, <laughs> is JetGPT. And I have to say, this is a little bit shocking. Um, and, and Markus, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it, it did summarize a lot of the stuff you were saying as well. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide. Um, um, but it obviously tells you that it's not just bacteria, even if I just talk about bacteria. It says to you that there is some changes. It will tell you about the neurotransmitters. It will talk to you about the joint chain fatty acids. It will actually say a lot of very right things. And I was amazed. Um, you, you need to interact a little bit with JetGPT, and then it feels like it opens the right library and gives you actually a very solid uh, summary. And then... <laughs> I thought it was really funny because obviously, um, then I asked the same question, what, what do you think about dementia? Yeah, so, um, and, and I hope you realize that your answers were far not as complex as little jet GPT did, um, because it also said, oh, it's similar to epilepsy, right? Then so, oh, I was like glad I gave this talk now because there are some correlations. Um, it says that then obviously inflammation in human response very similar to epilepsy. The only difference was, and that as you um, I'm sure all aware is that the amylo tau protein are not only found in the brain, but they're also found in the gut. And there are different types, and people say there are different uh, types of presentation of that disease process, but often um, it can be even the first uh, where you see the pathology before you actually see any changes in the brain. So very interesting. And then how does this actually work, right? This is the thing, how can it be down there and also um, at the top. I find it puzzling, and I will not be able to answer these questions. But you can see that obviously neurotransmitter metabolites are very similar to epilepsy. And, and if you think about diseases in general, we obviously, especially your brain, is very complex, very diverse, and very amazing, beautiful. But when we show pathophysiology, 
there's always very simple ways it can show it. That's why when you look at diseases, often if it's Alzheimer, epilepsy, dementia, it's always the same type of neurotransmitter how, the, how somehow are involved in the process. I will not go because uh, Marcus did a fantastic presentation and I would not do justice um, for the level he's at. But what we will talk about, that the brain still wins, right? So gastroenterologists, um, you have less neurons to play with. It's definitely neuron neurons like um, Natasha and I will win. I, we will talk a little bit about the vagal nerve. We will talk about the bloodstream and talk, you know, how we can modulate the gut um, microbiota uh, and talk also about fecal transplant. But the first thing is the question, how does actually the interaction work and which are a modulating factor? One of them is definitely stress, um, and, um, and we do know this. Um, this is probably the most effective treatment trial I've ever done in my whole life. Um, we ask owners to collect saliva yeah, from their dog and themselves, which also made me realize why I have become a veterinary doctor and not a human doctor because saliva from people is rather interesting and they fill up the pot, which is also very nice, and they really fill it up so you don't want to get a urine sample. Um, and, and then obviously, um, we, um, none of the dogs seizured after we asked them the task, right? That's the reality. So none of them stopped all seizuring. Um, but we realized that there was a stress response after the seizure, yeah? However, what we also realized is that dogs with epilepsy have a very altered stress response. They have often a stress fatigue, um, and then when they have the stress, they can overreach, which is very different. So they have a chronic disease process. We also know from uh, this very nice study, and there's other data out there, that the relationship of the cortisol of dogs is directly related also to the one from the owner, and vice versa. And Everyone who's a clinician <laughs> knows that if you have a neurotic owner, then you often have a neurotic dog, right? That's a, that's a correlation as well, right? Um, and, and I found this very interesting. And, and actually now, I, I won't speak about this, but you, you might know I've done a lot about corona sniffer dogs. Dogs are able to also, there was a nice paper last year in August showing that dogs can smell cortisol. They can even smell it, right? So it's a really interesting um, a field. And, and we know this. So we know that actually when you calm owners, then also the dog becomes calmer and they have less gastrointestinal signs, they have less of other um, symptoms, um, and they are bad. And, and, and we did a qualitative study, which is for a scientist always very hard, but it sums up at the end, we have a ticking time bomb. They felt really strongly that this stress um, influenced them, and a lot of them said that there were, um, were many, many problems, and we talk about all right, all right, all right, all right. I only have only one. Is it an emotional disease? It feels frightening right. because you don't feel under control. It's an uncontrollable, unpredictable oh. disease process. And this is what you all think epilepsy is, a recurrent seizure activity. But that's actually not true. There is an interictal period. Yeah, you have one seizure in a while and there is something change in the interim. We nowadays define um, epilepsy as a brain disease. Um, and, and, and when you ask people what else is epilepsy, they will tell you a portfolio of things. We did um, a launch of an epilepsy app uh, um, uh, when I was still at the Royal Vet College. And the idea was to give people a tool that they get also a bit more control. And there was a lady uh, um, who uh, did have epilepsy herself. Um, it took her a very long time. Um, actually, she had to find the right lifestyle, the right diet, the right drugs. And then after uh, 20 years, she became seizure-free. So it took a long time to become seizure-free. The reason why we knew her, she made also dog clothing. <laughs> And then we had like a win-win situation. We have this app, and do you want to talk about your epilepsy? And I spoke about drugs, and you give more drugs, and you was like, Holger, <laughs> yes, you know, if you have a seizure, that's bad. If you're in central London have a seizure, you might be robbed afterwards. But that's just a couple of seconds. If you are, you know, if I have a seizure at home, then my, 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 my sister makes me chicken soup. So chicken soup obviously doesn't help not only for colds, it might also help for post ictal type for seizures. But that's okay. But actually, with a disease, I have to live every day of my life, every second. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I can't remember things anymore. I, I'm frightened. 
um, I have fear and anxiety attack. And I was like, wow, that really threw me. And I was like, you know, we all had a little bit of tears up because I just thought we need to stop the main clinical science. It's a seizure activity, and that's it, right? So, so that really got us thinking. Um, um, and then, as always, you look in the past, and somehow the life, I'm really sorry, Jan, I know that you travel a lot, but there was a time you were just sitting with your wine and some olives, and then you had some great ideas, and you can have probably Hippocrates for anything. I'm sure they had said something about gut-brain access as well, just thinking there. But he knew that it's melancholics become epileptics, epileptics become melancholics. They knew that there's a bidirectional relationship. Then obviously, uh, people nowadays have looked into this more detail. There's some good evidence uh, data that there are a big overlap of disease categories and comes back to what I said earlier, complex diseases have simple tools how they can change pathology. Um, so you will have more epileptics when they have depression, anxiety, but it's also the other way around. When they have that, they also develop epilepsy. The same is for ADHD, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Don't worry, I won't go through the whole slides. Um, I always put some QR code if you want to read the paper, if you can't sleep at night. Um, but what we did, and I found this really interesting, so we, we asked, we asked, and we, we had no more ideas, you know, not, um, uh, we, we, we asked them, what should we do next in our research? Yeah, we asked uh, neurologists, we asked uh, practitioners and, and, and owners, and I was amazed how ignorant we are. <laughs> because the owners already realize that those comorbidities and anxieties exist. We all, yeah, we thought about new drugs, the gene for epilepsy and all these things. So they already knew that, yeah? And we know that dogs do have, this is an image of our brain gym, they have anxiety disorders. We actually published on this and there's now multiple papers. I think there are 10 papers out of it. When we first published it, people didn't really believe us, but we know that 70% of dogs with epilepsy have behavior change. And it's normally fear and anxiety type um, of disorders and it's mainly to strangers, strange dogs, strange owner, uh, I mean, not strange owner, maybe said, but a strange person, yeah? <laughs> Probably the, the being a male vet is always bad because they, you know, you come to the dog and they don't love you and then the owner doesn't love you and all this thing. It's so much better, yeah. But, but you know, that was the main thing they found and other people found the sa same thing. The other thing is what, what we do find as well, and that's an interesting story again. Rovina Packer, which you will see um, on, on multiple of those videos um, is, is also um, said to me because I said, oh yeah, they have these, 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 these German shepherds and uh, the border collies um, with the cluster seizures, very difficult to control. And I said, oh, you know, they, they, they all are, are different. They probably have some anxiety. Like, no, no, but look at them. They have problems with the impulsivity control. They can't control, they, they can't concentrate. This must be something different, right? And I think, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously not ADHD like in, like in people, but they do have some clinic signs. And then came this really nice paper out from, from Taya. And what she found, what she found was that um, in, in, in Lagotto Romagnolos, they, they are called, they have a benign childhood epilepsy. And it's called benign because they stop um, seizing after a while. So they grow out of having epilepsy, okay? However, guess what? When she looked at them five, six years later, they still had behavior changes. And she said, oh, they have ADHD. And I was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting because if you say that, then behaviors will actually shoot you by saying this, right? Because it doesn't exist in, in dogs. However, we do know that they have problems with impulsivity control. They are hyperactive and so on. And we see that in these dogs, we have more severe phenotype. So this is my time at the RBC. Uh, Michelangelo and uh, Donald. Um, I still feel the same internally, but this is how I aged, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> that, that's the reality. Um, and, 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 the, and the thing is, and I'd say, you understand in a second, uh, what we do know now, um, that these diseases are all interlinked, and I could show you others. You know, there's vascular, there's Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer, dementia, and epilepsy, and we talk about, obviously, the microbiome today. And the question is, when does Holger become abnormal? So when, when is it abnormal that I don't find my keys? Is it in the morning when um, I'm looking for my keys, and I do this all the time, and my wife then tells me they are, on, they are there where you should have left them, <laughs> which in a stress situation when I have a high cortisol level does not help me, um, which makes our interrelationship not good in this time period of the day when the kids need to be organized to be shipped somewhere. 
right? Uh, but probably everyone would agree if I find my keys in the fridge, that's up, up normal, right? And, and like, you, you know, Pascal said earlier, you know, there's a long time period when, when you don't know. So when is actually already the tipping point of the curve? When does it change? Um, and, and as you can see here, is it becomes very late. And it's also the reason, I think, why thousands of very potential candidates, especially for dementia research, they didn't find um, into clinics because when we see the patient as a human, I'm, I'm sure they see them earlier than us, and, and Natasha will talk a lot more about it, because we see a person who's at the end of the day stuck in a corner and peeing against the, the door frame, right? That's, that's a very late, late time point when we start thinking about modulating the disease process. We need to be a lot earlier, and I, I really think that um, doing what Nesta is doing at the moment, finding a better biomarker, earlier treatment point is really excellent. So we need to, to start earlier, and that's why a lot of the rodent work failed, because they obviously did this. Um, but then we know that diseases can be modulated. We heard a lot about um, different factors which can shift us, and epilepsy is, is, is one of them. Um, saying this, you know, very intelligent people have it. It doesn't mean it shifts us all the time, but as you have realized, it's an overlay, so you have often uh, a, a process. We did a study where we had adult dogs, uh, um, owners of adult dogs. Um, we didn't want to bias it, um, and we asked them, you know, different questions, um, different standardized questionnaires. And the interesting thing was when we had those four and a half thousand uh, dog owners answer, was that, and, and that was good at that moment, because I didn't think at that time so much about dementia and, and age um, being a factor, was the epilepsy featured. But also, when dogs are older than 12 years, that the problems in trainability, they also showed us that positive reinforcement helps to keep the, the, the mind awake, and then there were obviously certain drugs which aggravate the situation. Um, when you look at um, a score, this here in this one we used the, uh, um, the CCDR, uh, canine cognitive dysfunction uh, um, um, rating scale, and, and again, epilepsy featured, as did obviously age uh, in that population. You see a big variety when you look at the blue, because obviously dogs are very different. So we know, for epilepsy at least, that um, if you don't, it's kind of a two-hit model. Um, um, if you have already a tendency um, not to be the smartest, then you, you will aggravate by the disease process, yeah? Um, and we did um, look at this more detail, and you understand in a second why this becomes important. We found out that it's mainly the spatial memory, which is uh, inhibited by these dogs, uh, not so much the problem solving. And this makes actually perfect sense. Um, and I know that every one of you has read many uh, images of the brain, but what, what we see here, this is a dog which had severe post-ictal changes, and then um, um, uh, two years later, you can see that, can you see that, yeah, there's actually parts of the brain missing. And when we look at the areas which are very susceptible for long-term damage, guess which areas they are. There's an limbic system. This is where your behavior is. That's also where your hippocampus is. So they are very much in the proximity uh, of, of each other. So it makes perfectly sense that they can be altered uh, together and that you have the problems uh, in that area. And actually, more interestingly, and let's understand in a second where, where I'm going with this, um, is that we also know from a very nice publication with from Daisuke, who has shown that the areas um, of those altered brain regions have a change in glucose metabolism. Um, here in, in blue is the inter period. It's actually blue, so it doesn't have as much glucose activity. Um, in the seizure, obviously, you will have a lot of glucose activity. Yeah, it makes totally sense. But that's interesting because it's the inter period where we have the problem. So that kind of thought like, hey guys, there needs to be something, perhaps we are not giving the energy this tissue needs uh, to provide it. So we know obviously glucose is very important. We learned this because at least my parents always gave me some <laughs> sugary stuff before the exam, so I get an insulin peak and sleep after half an hour. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, we know, we always say, you know, the, the brain needs glucose, and that's kind of true. Actually, neurons, uh, especially when you get older, are five to six times better on ketone bodies. 
um, it's the supporting cell, the glia cells, which need a lot of um, glucose. We know already from also some research um, here, Gary is also in the room, um, did this nice study, where we know already that the glucose metabolism is also an aging change uh, uh, in the brain, and that's very similar to what happens in epilepsy. And they obviously um, then thought about giving me medium chain glucosides to dogs, which can increase your ketone uh, bodies and give an alternative energy source, and, and, and that's what we did. So then we looked at the same thing. Okay, we said, okay, the, brain, the aging brain is, is very similar than the epileptic. Let's see if it works for epilepsy. We did this. We gave a medium chain glucoside uh, in the first study and then had a very good response, very similar, to be honest, if you have a dog on two antiepileptic drugs and I give a third one, it would be very similar to that result, yeah? So we see around in the epilepsy clinic we had on the third, a 14% seizure freedom, and that was the same for these. Um, we did something really radical. This was a difficult study to publish. We did the same study again. <laughs> that sounds really bizarre, but we always say we have to repeat our studies. That's not easy to do because you don't get them published, right? Um, um, because it's not novel anymore. And you know the journals don't accept it because they don't, don't get cited as many times. That's the real reality. But we did the same. We did it modified slightly. We, 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 we added some oil above um, the food rather than have it integrated in the food. And we saw, again, a very good um, epilepsy response. And we did another study where we found around a 30% uh, improvement. Saying this, we found multiple studies which around a third of the patients respond, and which is interesting. Um, we also found that um, behavior improved and um, that obviously, and that was not surprising, also the um, ADHD type symptoms improved. More interestingly, and like I said, this was um, also not surprising, is that when we gave the MCTs, the medium chain decoderides, the C8 to C12, that the dogs also improve in their cognitive function. Yeah, so because we just gave an alternative energy source, and that's an area which uh, uh, um, improves not only the seizure susceptibility, but also the cognitive um, function. But the other thing is what is interesting. I have to stop here and tell you first about something else what happens during epilepsy. We heard earlier that you get neurotransmitter changes. What Marcus didn't speak about is that the neurotransmitter in the gut, now here we measure them in the urine, and, and the reason is because of the assays we used. The question is, how does it get into the blood-brain barrier? Because all the textbooks say, you can't get through it. it it's not penetrable, right? It's, it's a tight junction. Um, and that's interesting. So the question we have, and there's no answer for that, is it perhaps wrong what's in the textbooks? Perhaps there is more penetrance? Or is it that we modulate the enteric nervous system and then by giving the vagal nerve changes, then we remodulate the brain, right? But what we did is they said, okay, let's look um, and, and look at those behavior profiles. We couldn't find a difference there, so I didn't show the data, but we looked in epilepsy. And actually, actually, when you look at it, this is neurotransmitter in the urine, and we found very similar results what you would expect in the brain. Changes in serotonin, GABA glutamate is always the, the key, right? So you have too, much, too little GABA, more glutamate, and it could explain you why you have more seizure susceptibility. Um, we also then looked at dogs which were treated. Um, there we had an increase in serotonin. Also serotonin is actually anti-seizure activity, and we also had an increase in GABA. Again, very much replicating what you would expect in the brain. Um, and, and you mentioned already, Marcus mentioned a little bit about it, but serotonin is something you have for your mood, but it also has a role in epilepsy. So it kind of makes sense that we found this. Uh, glycine is another inhibitor uh, neurotransmitter, and again, can have mood and epilepsy associated and cognitive functions signs. GABA glutamate is kind of the key things. We always try to balance this. It's also when we do the drugs. We want to balance, the, increase the GABA, reduce the glutamate to make them less likely to seizure again. Um, and again, uh, um, that makes totally sense what we found there and, and, and what you have. No epinephrine, epinephrine, we had to look a little bit more closer because there's some neurotransmitter which are not as uh, uh, so much knowledge, but when you look at it, it also fits the profile, what our findings were uh, with what you can see in dementia and ADHD type activities. 
then what we did is we used the same platform and looked what happens when you feed the dogs MCT diets. And um, no surprise, what actually happened is GABA went up and GABA glutamate went up, uh, right, again, the shift towards a more inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter profile. And this is in the urine, yeah? I'm just saying this again, it was not in the brain. However, and this is unpublished data, and I, just because we're under friends, I tell you, we also found that the changes are, when you measure it in the brain by MRI spectroscopy, you also find the same changes in the brain. So, which is really interesting. And the more interesting thing is even that in the glutam uh, glutamate um, receptors in the thalamus were unchanged, but in the limbic system, they were actually downregulated, which is again very interesting because it fits very much that dogs, when they have an MCT diet, don't change their type of, they're still alert, but actually they have less of the side effects, the comorbidities and seizure activity. So we have two main things, and don't worry, I will not give you now a, a lecture about you know, um, all the antiepileptic drugs, but main, main area we normally work on is the inhibitory pathway. We always try all our drugs when the GABA ergic. That's why they have so many side effects. But actually some of the MCTs can have direct effects also on the glutamate receptor, on a, a specific one on the AMPA receptor. So we don't only have a change in the in giving an, an, another energy source. We also have actually a change in the neurotransmitter profile, at least in the urine, and I told you something about the brain, but we also have a potential direct effect of, of them on the AMPA receptors. Don't worry, I will not go through this, but you can take a picture, and if you can't sleep at night, like I said, you can read this, but this summarizes all the effects we know at the moment what happens when you give MCTs. However, Jan asked me to talk about the gut, right? So um, um, obviously um, we, we did send um, also feces um, and um, uh, perhaps me as a neurologist, I can do an unbiased. You always e expect, you know, the huge dysbiosis <laughs> and then it was always not. <laughs> so there was actually, in all the epileptic dogs we sent, there was no, no dysbiosis, yeah? Unless they had gastrointestinal disease. Um, but um, the, then you always expect that you find the magic bullet and that you find those bacteria which are, and you always find some minor changes. And yes, you see the different studies now and they always found some bacteria. And then I think what is really missing is then we find associations. It's a little bit, I feel like, it's when we started to find genes. We found a gene defect. We found some studies in a mouse. We said, oh, this gene is responsible for this. Then we said, this is probably the reason why this animal has this disease. And then suddenly, all the papers said, hey guys, um, can you also show me if it's functionally changing anything in that species, right? Or did some fibroblasts or whatever uh, work? And I think this, I have the, sometimes the same feeling here. We find some changes, but we, we, we find association, but we don't always find causality, or we at least assume causality and never know if it's really there. Um, when, when, and that's what we did. <laughs> um, and you will see in a second why Ackermansia becomes very important because there was like the, um, you said earlier, the leap, leap paper in epilepsy for, for that. Um, but we, we found uh, a bacteria which is, which is relatively close and we then also found that there might be some explanation why this could, uh, the bacteria uh, could actually account for less um, aggressive or changes in the behavior and could this also affect the epilepsy, what we saw there. Um, and this is the lead paper. Um, so, uh, and this has been heavily um, debated as well, um, but they did a really neat experiment. Um, they gave also a ketogenic diet, yeah, very similar to what we did. And they had um, mice which responded, um, had a, a certain seizure threshold, and others who didn't. And then they did the classic experiment, which we heard before, we, you know, take it from an old person, give it to a young, young to an old. So they, what they did, obviously, is they now gave, uh, did a fecal transplant from the one which responded to the one which didn't respond, and guess what happened? They responded, yeah? But then, and that is why it is a nice paper, they did a go and what they do easily more in rodents, obviously, they looked um, also in their brain metabolism, they found that certain bacteria probably changed the GABAergic profile in the brain, and they looked specifically by microdissection in the hippocampus amygdala uh, limbic system and shown this thing. And they found also which bacteria were responsible, Acamansia and the Parabacteroides. So, so that 
gave us also an idea, and I'll show you later where we came with that, and said, taking this approach, and if you actually can replicate this also in the dog. And there was another very nice study done here in North Carolina, where they had did a slightly different approach, where they said, okay, let's have a, a kind of a twin population, not even if it were not twins, but dogs in the same household, the one with epilepsy, the one without, and is there a change uh, in certain bacteria, and many um, lactobacillus, what they looked at, but they couldn't find a difference. What they found, obviously, in rodents before. Um, he, they did another study then, um, and I think one has to be a little bit careful because they had um, 10 epileptic dogs and then had healthy beagles controlled from the hospital. It would be like if we would take our beagles, because obviously they're obviously different capped, but they did find some changes and then also found some associations. So the pseudomonas um, were obviously, and then you know that we know that they can change GABA and glutamate, but the reality is not 100% uh, what they do. The one which is probably a little bit more is a Prevotella. Uh, there's another study also done with Jan and Nick Jeffrey where they found that they also have an influence in inflammatory disease. So we found again an, an association. What we then did is to say, okay, if I give phenobarb, what does it actually do to the microbiome? Yeah? Um, and uh, and I, I'm really sorry for Anya because she wanted to be a neurologist and now she did all poop sample. Um, anyhow, but um, what we did is, and, and that's not easy for us to do. I'm not sure if it's for Natasha easy to do, but for us to see a, a drug-naive patient with epilepsy, we normally see patients with a lot of drugs, they come to us, right? But we had those drug-naive patients, we followed them up after 90 days and then uh, did the various uh, um, analysis. One thing which I found interestingly is that they had a decrease in actually in their fear uh, behavior. And the reason for that makes actually perfect sense. I only see the screw up patients which already are uh, uh, drug resistant. They have also other comorbidities, but normally phenobarb will actually be anxiolytic. And then um, we also found, obviously, some changes. Uh, dysbiosis index, like I said, disappointingly was negative, um, but then obviously Jan explained me why. Um, they, we found some changes, but you know, I'm not sure how much um, uh, they are really making the difference. What I do think makes a difference, and that was, I thought, really interesting, and was for me a little bit pattern interrupt. We also did a metagenomic approach. There was nothing really there, even if you have so many samples. Uh, so many comparison factors. But what I found interesting was that uh, the short-chain fatty acids were up. And you heard this earlier from uh, an earlier talk that obviously there is also a role in that. Um, one of them, which is very well studied, is inflammation, but it can also be um, um, actually an alternative energy source and can be neuroprotective. So we found an increase in propionate and butyrate. And the interesting thing was in the dogs which responded to phenobarbital, which were seizure-free, they had a higher increase in the butyrate levels, yeah? So, which I thought was interesting because this is something I never thought of when you give phenobarb that you actually might change your butyrate levels. Why would you, right? And would give you a totally different um, way of potentially action and shows us also that we need to look deeper when we do those uh, uh, medications and, and think about this. Um, I spoke to you earlier um, about that obviously FMT, the fecal transplant. I said, like, when I went to Hanover, I said, like, okay, come on, let's just do it. Yeah, we write an animal test of it and we have a look if it actually works. So the idea was, can you transplant uh, behavior to make them be better and also improve their seizure control by transplanting them? So poor um, Anja um, had, uh, obviously, thanks to also Munich, who helped us with that, uh, we had uh, dogs which were not responding um, to uh, phenobarbital um, and uh, normally were multi-resistant. And we had to find a donor, which is really difficult because to find a dog which is seizure-free, um, responds really well to treatment. Um, we didn't have a normal dog. We took a dog which had also epilepsy because we wanted to see if we can transplant the response. Yeah? Um, and and that, was, that was really interesting <laughs> because, um, yes, obviously, like I said, there were some changes in the microbiome. I also have the donor here, um, uh, uh, but I clip over this because the story actually becomes more interesting now. What I found really interesting is you see that the donor who responded very well to treatment had less of the ADHD uh, type of behavior, and we've done also an automated computer analysis, so this is quite uh, not only um, questionnaire data, but this is the donors. This was the population before, and then they all moved down to the donor. So you could really transplant the behavior. 
yes, it has been shown in rodents, but this was still very surprising for me. The drug, re the, the response to the treatment, as you would all want to know, if the seizure have improved, this was the typical one-third uh, improvement, and you don't know if it's placebo response or if it's real or not. Um, th that was more difficult. People did report there was a better quality of life. But we also found, guess what? Again, a change in uh, neurotransmitter, and we found again the shift to more GABAergic and reduction in glutamate, so we had a better GABA-glutamate ratio. So very, very similar. So whatever we transplanted, we transplanted something good and made them more responsive. But wait for this. This is kind of the, the moment. Um, we did something other very cool. Um, we had uh, uh, intestines, uh, intestine model and from guinea pigs. And what we did is we took feces of dogs which had epilepsy, um, control dogs, dogs which responded to treatment and dogs which didn't respond to treatment. Um, so group A were the normal controls. And then what you could see two things. Uh, these are individual si single neurons. You can see neuron one, neuron two, neuron three, and four. And you can see that each of them have different uh, firing rates. And what we found, and I'll show you here just the burst frequency, that um, the drug naive patients had an increase in burst frequency. The treated one had actually an improvement in the burst, burst frequency. Yeah? Um, the drug resistant ones had a lower burst frequency than drug naive patients, but they had more, and I don't show this data here now in the slides, but had more neurons firing. And, 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 that's, and that's an interesting thing, because then we thought, okay, this is just a phenobarb. So we diluted phenobarb and did the same model, and we couldn't see the response. So something in the feces of these dogs with epilepsy changes the firing pattern um, in, of those neurons. Yeah? Is it the butyrate? Who knows, yeah? And then there's also always a question, can you actually treat it with antibiotics, epilepsy? Does it get better? So people have done this, and then they find them. But you have to be really careful. There's a really high placebo effect um, for that. However, this is my last story, and th th this probably could end my marriage. Um, this is the story of Trudy, yeah? Um, Trudy has had epilepsy. Trudy was one of the pharmacoresistant patients she had fecal transplant. She became seizure free. She returned to the hospital. She had a skin condition. My wife is a dermatologist. What did my lovely wife do? <laughs> she gave her antibiotics. <laughs> what did happen? Trudy had her skin condition better controlled, but her epilepsy returned. Um, so now um, we worked this out, um, and um, Trudy is seizure free again. Um, um, but it shows you very nicely. That doesn't mean that every dog suit works. It's not a magic bullet as they all are. Um, we do know there's a top-down effect, a bottom-up effect, um, uh, and we discussed in detail uh, what it is, how this all relates, but I do think diets play a role, and also changing the microbiome also plays a role in neurodegenerative diseases in general. Um, and I'm not a gastroenterologist. <laughs> Thank you for listening.